Hi. My name is Jillian Schwedler, and I am a professor of political science at the City University of New York, Hunter College, and the Graduate Center. Um, I'm really happy to be here today to be able to talk to you about my new book, which came out last year. Um, it's called Protesting Jordan, Geographies of Power and Dissent uh, from Stanford University Press. Um, and it is a book that looks at protests in Jordan uh, from the 19th century to the present. So it's very sweepingly historical and it's intended to uh, push back against some of the contemporary uh, ways in which we think about protests. Um, protests tend to be looked at either as so it's from the social movement theory framework where mm -hmm. you interested in a particular movement and then the question becomes that protests are something the movement does along the way or um, we have these protest event data sets where you have a number of um, uh, the, these quantitative data sets where you're counting the number of protests and the number of people showing up. I'm not against those approaches but I'm really much more historical in my own approach and so I start in the 19th century in the Ottoman period in Jordan. Jordan is uh, located in the Levant region of the Eastern Mediterranean. And I look at the acts of resistance starting under the Ottoman Empire and I trace a lot of the patterns up to the present. The book is really sweeping, as I said, historical in its breadth, but also it asks some really broad questions relevant to social science and historical research. Uh, one of the big questions is, what roles do protests play in state making and state maintaining? So rather than simply looking at protests as disruptions um, to normal time politics or um, the beginning of a colonial period and going away, I really trace them through. I show that protests are pretty common and widespread. Um, a second big um, approach <clears throat> that I, um, uh, a second uh, big set of questions has to do with why protests take place in the places they do and take the forms they do, and similarly why state responses are um, different and can vary. And so I show, for example, you can have protests on the same topic on the same day, uh, and one set of protests will be left undisturbed by the regime, and another set of protests will be violently put down. So I'm curious in why that's the case. Um, I also look at routine protests, protests that are non-transgressive, that don't seem to disrupt anything. Um, I look at those through a longer historical lens as well. And finally, I, I take Jordan not just as an independent case study, but as something embedded in regional politics as well as global politics. So I'm interested in uh, flows of various sorts, but also security arrangements. Um, financial investments, uh, alliances, flows of people in, in and across the region, pilgrims, uh, and up again until today, looking at the sort of security sector and financial investments in Jordan. So <clears throat> it's a real sweeping book. Um, I have three main interventions that are woven through the chapters. Um, so I'm just going to go through the chapters and sort of highlight some of those issues and some of the topics. Um, the, it's a very, uh, the book has a lot of uh, images in it because it's a very visual um, uh, argument. So, but I'll do my best to sort of describe it as much as possible. So I start off in, as I said, in the Ottoman period in the 19th century. Um, I'm sure to actually my view of protests, I'm looking a very sort of general sense of protest is um, people gathering in public to make claims towards some authority or some elite. Um, it, often the state or colonial powers, imperial powers, but not necessarily. There could be others as well. And so um, that definition of protest allows me to include uh, some of the acts of rebellion and resistance that took place in the Ottoman period. And those were primarily um, petitions. Petitioning was a huge um, an issue. There were hundreds of petitions that were sent from Jordan to Damascus or to Istanbul to the Ottoman administrators. Um, some of these petitions included requests like, um, you're taxing us too often, uh, you're making our women carry water to the off Ottoman officers, and that's not cool, that's not appropriate. So they're really specific requests. Um, there's also a lot of rebellions against uh, what they see as too heavy taxation or too heavy involvement in local politics. And so we'll often see as well um, occupying, um, uh, taking over Ottoman garrisons, occupying them, 
um, some of these these uh, rebellions get quite violent and people die on both sides, Ottomans as well as those rebelling as well. Um, so I traced some of these and one of the insights from this early uh, attention to this early um, period is that a lot of those techniques continue to today. Not the deaths so much, of course, not killing police officers, although that can happen on occasion, but a technique such as blocking roads um, to disrupt transit um, and tr uh, trade and transit. Um, that's a, a technique that continues to today, uh, destroying infrastructure, which happened back then as well, um, destroying the Hijaz railway, blocking roads, tearing up roads, rendering them impassable was a way to get attention. Um, burning police stations is a technique that continues to today. Uh, so we see this, a lot of these through lines of these practices and protests that continue in interesting ways when we extend the, the lens to a much longer historical um, view. So I think that's a really sort of uh, helpful insight in thinking about the kinds of protests that continue until day. So in the early, early chapter, one of the, one of the um, arguments that I show is that protests, as I said, are central to state making and state maintaining. And by this I mean, as I said, they're not simply these periodic disruptions that get put down. Uh, and this is often forgotten in a lot of the literature, particularly but not only about Jordan. So the story of the creation of the modern state of Jordan is that it was an Ottoman period, but it was very decentralized. The Ottomans didn't have a lot of control except the north-south corridor, the transit route for pilgrims and trade, uh, and the Hejaz Railway, <clears throat> which went from Damascus down to uh, uh, Medina. So, uh, so the, the story is often told that uh, after the Great Arab Revolt, World War I, um, the British and the French carved up the region and decided who was going to control which part, which they did through the Sykes-Picot Agreement. And yes, there was some resistance, but basically the British, which uh, took control of Iraq and the new state of Jordan, uh, Transjordan area, but it would become the new state of Jordan, and installed as head of those regimes are these proto-regimes, um, Hashemites, the two sons of, of <clears throat> uh, the uh, Sharif Hussein, who led the Great Arab Revolt, uh, at least symbolically. He was a very old man, so he didn't actually lead the revolt. His sons did. So Jordan, then, is a case where this uh, Abdullah, the son of Hussein, of, uh, of the Hashemites, is put in place with British support. And the story is basically told that, yes, there was some resistance, but the British put them down violently, and then they proceeded with the state-making process, <clears throat> and that was the end of that. That's not really what happened. I mean, it does happen if you look at it from that global level, but historically what actually happens is the state that emerges emerges in response to the kinds of resistance that, that take place, and you can see those effects until today. So to give just a few of the many examples I talk about in the book, um, the um, when the king when the, the emir um, Abdullah arrives with British support into the Jordanian area, he's met with some opposition, and some people are, you know, happy. Finally, there's going to be an Arab ruler that's being supported, as opposed to the Ottomans who have been there for hundreds of years, uh, or the British who are also seen as outsiders. Um, but others opposed it. So after some months of settling there, he's going to establish his capital, and he chooses this town in the north called Salt. And he takes his entourage and they move up to Salt. And when they get there, they turn out to be met with um, days and days of protests because the Salties don't want them anywhere near there. And so an enterprising sheikh um, from the Bani Sakhar tribe says, hey, why don't you settle on Bani Sakhar land? There's this little town called Amman that's really small town, seasonally inhabited. It's not my center of power. Nobody's going to resist you there because it's Circassians and Chechens that had been settled there by the Ottomans, um, others from outside. It's basically a trading post. <clears throat> so Amman becomes the capital um, because of protests. And uh, it changes the whole geography. Rather than those towns on a north-south corridor that were most influential, this other nothing town becomes the center of the political and economic investments and that you see up until today those other cities are now peripheral to Amman as a result of protests um, also in the early period the Bedouin were resisting and raiding and creating so many problems and tearing up the railway and infrastructure all the British are trying to put into place the the Bedouin are tearing it up um, and the way they resolved that was to hire the Bedouin to provide protection so instead of tearing up the railway we'll hire you to protect the railway and this becomes the proto-army that eventually becomes the Jordan Armed Forces. And up until today, you have very heavy Bedouin presence in the armed forces. 
as a result of those raids. And just to give in one final example, um, the um, uh, one group uh, uh, from the um, Adwan tribe we're really frustrated. This is in the 20s, the 1923. They're frustrated because this new emerging regime doesn't seem to give them enough jobs or enough influence. And they're sort of watching what's happening. And they're like, hey, we need more jobs. We want some prominent positions. And they march on the Capitol and on the second march to demand jobs, to demand more influence. Um, they're also angry because people from Syria and elsewhere are being brought in for some of these new proto-government positions. And they're like, we want the jobs. Um, on their second major demonstration, the Royal Air Force uh, comes in to put down the demonstration and aerially bombs them and dozens are killed, which is completely unacceptable. Um, and so very quickly to make amends to this tribe, they give them lots of influence and prominent positions. And so the Adwan up until today are prominent in uh, among the sort of, uh, one of the most influenced families close to the Hashimite regime because of that act of resistance. And so these are just some of the brief ways um, the, the political and economic geography and the decision with uh, Amman being the capital, the fact that um, certain families are prominent and close to the regime and others are not, um, the makeup of the security services of Bedouin, these are all effects of the state that have direct um, roots in acts of resistance and revolt. So the, 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 the book begins there, and then I move in closer to Amman, and I look at the sort of changing city of Amman from this little tiny few hundred and then to a few thousand to now it's uh, four to five million people, more than half of the population, um, how that changes. And that change has interesting effects on protests as well. So in the beginning, it's, there's a main downtown area, and there's an old mosque there called the Husseini Mosque, the Grand Husseini Mosque, um, where people would gather at the Grand Husseini Mosque to protest. Nothing to do with Islam, it was simply because it was a gathering place, a, a prominent um, landmark. And they would gather there and um, uh, protest, and then they would march to the municipal complex uh, not too far away. <clears throat> and so this sort of pattern of protest uh, takes root really, really quickly by the late 20s, and it continues up until today, that people gather at the Grand Husseini Mosque and they march to the municipal center. The mis municipal complex en ends up being moved at one point farther away, but they still became a place for marching. So in these early years, protests that took place in those spaces at the Grand Husseini Mosques were really politically impactful because with just a few hundred people, you could shut down the whole downtown area, the offices of government, the main hotels, the commerce area, and it didn't take a lot of people to do that. As the city has grown and expanded in all directions, um, the main commercial districts are not downtown. It's a very low-end goods downtown area. There's some tourist ruins. There's a uh, Amman used to be one of the Decapolis, one of the Roman, Greco-Roman cities 2,000 years ago, and so there's some Roman ruins downstairs. There's a amphitheater and a nymphaeum and a few other things and a citadel. So that's still downtown, um, but everything else has moved out. And so protests that take place downtown today sometimes have thousands and thousands of people. They're simply not disruptive anymore because uh, it's not the main commercial area, the government offices are down there, and if you're not right in the downtown area, because of the topography with the great uh, steep hills going off in different directions, uh, you don't even know that there's thousands of people protesting down there. So this is an interesting change that as the city has expanded, it has uh, uh, impacted the, the ability to protest to be disruptive. And here's where some of those I mentioned in the beginning, this trend to look at quantitative data sets. Um, this is where the trends um, the quantitative data sets would get it wrong because they would be looking at numbers of protesters turning out and you might see with these big downtown protests some spikes in protests that these are uh, contentious times. But in fact, protests at downtown at the Grand Husseini Mosque are among the least disruptive protests that take place in Jordan today. And so I trace that pattern of the changing city and how that affects protests. In a later chapter, I actually show how protests shape the built environment. So it's not just that the city expanding has rendered certain protests less contentious than other protests, which is, is certainly the case, um, but in fact the city has changed in part in response to protests. So what do I mean by that? Well in one instance in, in a part of the West Amman there's this big complex, it's a mega project with a bunch of gleaming skyscrapers, it's called Abdali Boulevard, and this was intended uh, to be uh, a new downtown, the new downtown for Jordan, 
meaning a downtown in kind of a metropolis kind of way, the sort of center of economic, vibrant life, investment, hotels, banks, etc. And this project, um, which required to clear an entire middle class neighborhood uh, and relocate um, a uh, transit hub, um, so inconvenienced a lot of people, this whole project actually um, uh, created a, a privatized public space. So this has impact, and this is true everywhere, not just in the Middle East, but in many places, um, where you have a right to protest, you don't have a right to protest on private property. You have a, pro a right to protest in public space. So right off the bat, this whole place is privatized because it's a privately owned um, project. Um, so people can't protest there. But what's interesting is that one end of the project um, there was a huge plaza, and you can see this on the artist renderings and the 3D model of what the project would eventually look like. And there was a huge plaza that never gets built. And the reason it doesn't get built is because uh, the planners of the project in conversation with government officials were concerned that people would use it for protesting. And so they simply didn't build a plaza uh, on this space. It's above uh, underground mall. So you see simply the top of the underground mall and the skylights, but there's no plaza there because they were concerned about protests. There's other ways protests have shaped the built environment. Uh, and particularly, the government has really tried to close down spaces where people protest and render them inaccessible. And this happens through a variety of techniques. Um, one is simply closing off those space with fences and walls so that you can't access them. Or someplace, in one instance, there's a huge uh, parking lot where people protested. And now there's a 10-foot concrete wall on two sides, the two exposed sides of it. So you can still access the parking lot. People can go in and out. You could go in and protest there. But with this 10-foot wall, nobody can see anything happening there anymore. And these walls and fences have gone up in many, many places in and around Amman. Um, you also see where there's had been protests previously. The, you get rid of any evidence of protests were there, obviously, placards and signs and stuff, but often nationalist symbols go up in these spaces. Um, sometimes uh, uh, statues to the military, armies, etc. Sometimes really, really big flags get put up in the place. You know, the world's tallest flag is something that everybody seems to want to do. Um, and so we see that as well. Um, we also see instances um, where you try to, as I said, try to eliminate any evidence of a, a protest. There's uh, Bahrain stance is perhaps the most iconic example of this. Its revolution in 2011 um, was uh, titled the Pearl Revolution because it took place as a center around a roundabout that had a huge statue um, with these arms and then a big pearl on top of it. And that was known as, it was like a hundred foot statue, <clears throat> a sculpture. And so after the, that protest is violently crushed and many, many people, are, hundreds of people are killed and many more injured and thrown in jail, very violent repression. Um, basically, the government disassembles the Pearl Roundabout statue entirely. The roundabout is converted into just a perpendicular intersection. And if that's not enough, there's a coin, uh, a Bahraini coin that had an image of the Pearl Roundabout on it. They pulled that coin from circulation and minted a new coin in its place. Right, so it's an like effort to eliminate any evidence of that. Another way protests shape the built environment is through exposures. Um, the iconic example of this, of course, is uh, the Baron von Hussmann's reconstruction of Paris in the 1860s and 1870s. So with those streets were widened in very many ways, they served many purposes. It allowed them to lay down infrastructure, sewage, water pipelines, etc. But as the geographer David Harvey has shown, those wide boulevards also ended outside of the city at army barracks. And so they served, those wide roads served as um, spaces for army to move quickly into the city to put down rebellion because we know we have a, a, a solid century of rebellion and resistance um, in France and particularly in Paris. So that's another way protests have shaped the built environment. In Jordan, that takes place in the, the Wehdat refugee camp. So in the late 60s, we have the um, emergence of the Palestinian resistance movement, the Fedayeen, uh, and various factions. And they're based in Jordan um, on the East Bank and launching attacks uh, across into the West Bank. And um, they also begin to clash with the Jordanian army. Um, and they have a strong uh, support base in the Palestinian refugee camps, including the, the Wehdat camp. And so 
there ends up essentially a civil war, but there's, you know, bombings and trying to sort of, the government's trying to bomb these neighborhoods to sort of crush them. They eventually succeed and there's tremendous damage. Uh, but in the reconstruction, in the Wichdat camp, which was one of the bases of resistance, there is now a huge wide bullet boulevard sliced down the middle of the camp and these sentry towers outside of the camp that look, it's a police station ostensibly, well it is a police station, but it looks more like a, a prison sentry tower where you can kind of look down into the camp. And so we see the camp is reconstructed in particular ways in response to protest. Another example, I mean there's dozens and dozens of examples in the book, but I'll give you just one more that's kind of a fun example. Uh, there's a, a urban university in Irbid, which is the northern town or city, um, and Yarmouk University is located in Irbid, right in the city. It's an urban campus. And in the 80s, there's some student resistance and student protests that takes place in the campus. And um, the government very heavily comes in heavy-handed. Eleven students are killed over the course of these clashes. And most of the activist organizers were drawn from um, the professional schools. So engineering, doctors, lawyers, uh, dentists, what have you. And so um, after that, when they're violently put down, the government builds a new campus called JUST, the Jordan, in, in English, JUST, the Jordan University for Science and Technology. And they get a brand new campus for those professional groups uh, and it's located not in the city, but out in the desert. So should any protests take place there, nobody's going to see them. They're going to be completely isolated from the urban center. So in these and many other ways, I show that, that the geography, the urban geography, the political geography, the economic geography of Jordan are in very many ways shaped, directly shaped by protests. Decisions are made directly after acts of resistance that take place. And so that's a big piece of the book. Um, one of the other the, uh, main points I talked about early on was these routine protests, and I have a chapter looking at protests that seem so boring and routine, they almost, like, you kind of, what's the point? Why are activists doing this? And so I, I zoom into a location uh, near these Kaluti protests. It's near a mosque in West Amman called Kaluti, and um, again, it's just a, a landmark. It has nothing to do with Islam, the protest. And this is a, a location not too far from the Israeli embassy. And so in 2000, with the outbreak of the Second Intifada, people gathered there and elsewhere in West Amman to march on the Israeli embassy and demand the end of the peace treaty with Jordan, um, Jordan's peace treaty with Israel. And thousands showed up and the government had to go to great lengths to block all the streets to keep people from being able to march on the embassy, um, which is what their you know, objective is to doing. Those continue for months on Friday every every month. Um, but as the months go on, the number of people showing up diminishes. So instead of thousands and thousands, you have sometimes have a few hundred and often just a few dozen that show up. But there's still march, marches on the Israeli embassy in that they intend to sort of go demand the peace treaty, but they're not actually trying to get to the, the embassy anymore. They're more performing this. So they meet in the same place, the police show up, they meet on this field next to the Kaluti Mosque, uh, they show up, they uh, uh, chant, have chants and speeches for a while, they eventually move into the street and block traffic, mm -hmm. and very slowly, over the course of a couple hours, they move towards the, up the road towards the Israeli embassy. And up the road, the police have now blocked a certain, in a cer at a certain um, house, the same location, they sort of line up across them. Now, what's interesting is they're they're blocking the march, but they're not actually blocking anybody else because they don't want to inconvenience anyone. So you can walk in and out of the protest. You can walk up and down the streets. Pedestrians walk up and down the street. Uh, nobody's concerned. I have in the book a um, number of photographs that I took at these protests where I go right up to the riot police and take photographs of them, maybe 10 feet away, and they completely leave you alone. And this isn't common in all, demo all non-democracies. This is an authoritarian state where you can just go up and photograph the riot police. Um, so that's partly why Jordan makes such an interesting case. And so what's going on here? They march, they, they up there, they, you know, confront the riot police, um, they shout at them. And then after, you know, 45, another 45 minutes or an hour, they go home or more likely they go off to cafe and, or go off to the bar and talk about what happened. So these protests happen like this over and over. And you're left with this, what's the point? You know, it's just a nuisance. Nobody thinks anything's going to go wrong. 
bystanders walk by and stop and take pictures. I'm in and out of the protest taking pictures, you know. So if you look at the conventional, you know, ways of thinking about protest, a pro we think about are they successful or did they fail? Like what did they accomplish? And so clearly they're not successful in that sense. And so I ask instead, what is the point? And so there's several things that I come up with. Uh, they know they're not going to cancel the peace treaty. They know they're not even going to get to the Israeli embassy. They're just sort of performing this. So on one thing that they tell me, activists tell me, is that um, they want to keep the topic in the public debate. So as long as they're having these protests, they're able to sort of talk and have conversations and get coverage by the media so the government knows and other people know that there still is opposition to the peace treaty. You can't say that everyone's just accepted it. So they're keeping the issue alive by that debate. They also tell me that they're trying to keep that space open. They're worried that if they stop protesting and try to start up again later, the government's not going to allow them. So as long as they adhere to these sort of red lines and don't cross the red lines, they feel they're pretty much left alone. And so they want to keep it open because, and this is another reason, the next time there's uh, a major Israeli military campaign, uh, people will know where to go, right? This will become known as a place for protest um, against Israel or, or in support of Palestinians. And that's another kind of political work. So it does these kinds of actions. Um, and one final one, which I think is interesting, is has to do specifically with the Muslim Brotherhood, but not only the Muslim Brotherhood, but in these protest um, you can see, and I have in the, the, the cam, uh, in my photographs, uh, people from different political parties, including the Muslim Brotherhood, the Islamic Action Front, but also leftist and communist and socialist parties and independent activists, all sorts show up there with their flags and stuff. So the Muslim Brotherhood shows up also with a photographer who takes a bunch of pictures of them with their green flags, and those pictures emerge in their newspaper the next day about how they're resisting the government and they're calling for the cancellation of the peace treaty and they're supporting Palestinians, etc. But what they don't say in their own newspaper articles is they show up, they take pictures, and they leave. The Muslim Brotherhood is never there when you're actually at the point of confronting the riot police. They're never there. They're always gone by then. So it's a really kind of a fascinating dynamic um, that it becomes more of a photo op. Similarly, those downtown protests when the Muslim Brotherhood has them uh, they'll have all the flags there, and you'll see these spectacular protests of thousands of people, and they're, you know, from these um, high view looking down at the crowds, and they're very dramatic looking. Um, and the pictures, they look very contentious. Again, these are circulated widely, but what you don't get from the pictures is they're not contentious. Uh, first place, they're not disruptive of anything downtown. The government's very happy with protests in the downtown area, where it tries to repress protests in many other spaces. Um, but also the Muslim Brotherhood has literally its own parade guards. They have people wearing yellow vests that are there to make sure nothing goes wrong in the protests, that no property is damaged, that the sidewalks are kept clear for pedestrians, etc. And so these protests that aren't going to accomplish what they set out to do can serve as uh, kind of photo ops for the different groups to sort of portray their importance and to show their constituents how relevant they are even if they're not actually contentious protests. And so that's another uh, point of these routine protests. By the way, that mosque, the Kaluti Mosque, when the big field where they gathered um, several years ago, there's a big fence around it. So the issue I talked earlier about closing down spaces has now happened uh, at that as well. That, fen that whole um, uh, field, which is a rocky field with some cabbage and broken pavement in it, um, is fenced off with a 10-foot fence and a sign that says for rent. So if you want to rent a rocky field for some purpose, you can rent it uh, there. Um, <clears throat> I called to try to find out why, the, why they put up the fence, but they kept hanging up on me. They didn't think I was a serious person. Um, so I guess I'll probably end it there. The book does a lot of other things. As I said, it talks about um, these sort of global and regional connections, which I'm happy to talk about. Um, Jordan has its own counterterrorism training center. Uh, this is kind of important because we see when we see things like the Arab uprisings, uh, we often talk about the regimes learning from each other and the pro like learning what was successful or what how do you respond, um, how do you clear the square, etc. You know, like the regimes are learning from each other, um, but it's actually worse than that. The regimes are literally training together. The the troops are training together, and Jordan is one of the places in the region where this takes place. It's certainly not the only one. 
but it has training at this Kosotic um, counterterrorism training center in courses such as uh, crowd control, how to clear a square, all kinds of issues directly related to policing of protests. And so uh, regimes from across the globe can go to Jordan to learn the latest techniques in policing protests and repressing protests. Uh, and so I, I really uh, draw that out pretty significantly at the end. And then the last piece, which is really more important for scholars of Jordan or of the Middle East, rather than I'm trying to give the sort of the kinds of ideas that I think have broader reach to other cases. But for Jordan, um, I show the sort of rising criticism of the king and of the regime, uh, especially in the past decade. So where there had been, uh, it's illegal actually, it's under several laws to criticize the king um, directly. So, and people are, there are hundreds, Human Rights Watch has a report now, there are hundreds of people in prison for criticizing the king. Uh, but one of the things I show in the book is that the criticism, the willingness to criticize the king at protests has really escalated in the past um, uh, uh, decade or so, since the uprising period. And so that's a really interesting development. Combined with this effort to shut down all these protest space, the government has really, while it doesn't tend to resort to live ammunition into crowds, massacres of this sort, it does use water cannons and uh, 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 mounted police and sometimes dogs to try to clear protest um, and shutting down these protest space. It doesn't want this vibrant protest culture that exists in Jordan. Um, but it exists and it's very diverse and uh, some of the protests are actually quite successful um, in terms of achieving what they wanted. Not the large protests, but you'll have protests over, we want, there's not enough water in the country. And so if water runs out in certain villages, they'll block the north-south roads uh, with burning tires or slabs of concrete so that the, the trade route is closed down. And they'll just sit out there on chairs until the, someone from the government comes and brings, brings them water. Um, protests because we don't have a cell phone tower in our area and we have bad reception. Uh, protests for jobs, the march to the capital and hang out until they get jobs. Um, so protests are actually also a way of negotiating and, and engaging with the regime over specific things as well as raising issues over large topics like the peace treaty with Israel, the U.S. war in Iraq, and what have you. So I guess I'll stop there because um, I covered a lot of ground. I've been talking for a half hour. Um, and I have a bunch of comments here. Um, my previous book, Faith in Moderation, yes. Um, is there a connection between the two books? The connection between the two books is that my interest in protest emerged from writing the first book, um, which was about Islamic political parties in Jordan and Yemen. Uh, both countries were having elections for the first time, um, not for the first time, but for the first time in a long time. And Jordan had last elections in the 60s, and with the 67 war had martial law until 1980. Well, 1990, but they had elections in 1989 and then 1993. Uh, and Yemen never had widespread elections until North and South Yemen un unified in 1990. So both of these countries are cases where you had vibrant Islamic groups uh, try to figure out how to become a political party. So that was the topic of, of my first, or, or that book of, of Faith and Moderation. Um, in the course of that, I ended up going to a lot of protests because the, they were very active in protests. And that's where I learned that they don't, the Muslim Brotherhood, and the Islamic Action Front in Jordan, um, particularly at the time, did not want to be contentious at all. They wanted, they wouldn't protest unless the government knew they got the sign off from the government. Some points you had to have a formal written protest permit, other points you didn't, the law changed, but they always wanted to make sure the government was okay with what they were doing. And so I learned that from them. And I also discovered how widespread protests were um, and how uncontentious they were. So it reminded me of when I was living in um, my first job was at the University of Maryland when I was living in Washington, like taxi drivers would be like frustrated at protests because they created traffic and sh closed down roads and you had to work around and they complain. And I discovered in Jordan it was the same way. Taxi drivers were like really annoyed by protests, but nobody was worried about them. Nobody was worried that, you know, there was going to be violence or anything. Um, if you were in Syria and you came across protest and riot police, you would get, get out of there very quickly. And here you didn't. So really, the sort of puzzle of uh, authoritarian regime with tons and tons of protests emerged from that first book. Um, and my ideas obviously evolved over the years. Um, but yeah, that, that's the sort of connection. Um, 
How do I manage access to unconventional sources? Well, I'm not sure what kinds of unconventional sources, but I could tell you what sources I do use. Um, I obviously attend protests as much as I can um, when I'm there. And so the ethnographies of like the routine protests come from me attending those protests over and over and over. So I could say with confidence what those routines are. Um, I also use archival work besides the sort of obvious archival work from like newspaper clippings that cover protests, etc. Um, activists that have their archives and like leftover placards and flyers and banners from other protests in the past, uh, oral histories with them as well. But I did of course use the British archives and the, the National Archives in the United States um, because diplomats are constantly sending memos and reports and so there's a lot of detail of protests and dynamics that take place in the in the, those archives uh, the British for the early period and the US from the 50s onward um, earlier too but especially from the 50s onward when they replaced the British um, oral histories um, secondary sources from other other analyses that are about other topics but will cover certain details and then another um, is simply memoirs um, there are some people alive from the early period, but they're mostly really, really old. More you could get, get people, older people from like the uh, 60s onward. Um, but a lot of people have personal memoirs. Um, so though many people publish like their grandfather's paper, their great grandfather's paper. So they have the memoirs and the documents and they'll self publish it. It won't, you won't find it in many bookstores. Um, but as you're talking to people, they would say, oh, so-and-so has a memoir too. And so I could get those memoirs and read those memoirs and um, often get information from protests that uh, came up in those. Um, even again, they weren't about protests, but you could find the, the resistance, what people were talking about, etc. Um, what does the West get wrong about politics in Jordan and in Arabic countries? Oh, that's a big question. Um, what would your advice to a journalist covering protests in Jordan today? So I think what the, I mean, the West, I would say is like governments and most people that have just a passing knowledge because what I'm talking about scholars of Jordan um, you know find recognizable you know so Jordan is often treated particularly in the United States um, but also by many of the Western European countries as a moderate regime um, and it's certainly moderate compared to Bashar al-Assad in Syria compared to many other you know Sisi in Egypt um, uh, it's certainly moderate by those terms, but in fact, you know, we forget it's an authoritarian regime. It likes to portray itself as democratizing slowly. It's not. The Freedom House Index has uh, uh, Jordan backsliding on freedoms quite consistently over the past decade. Um, and so I think that's this sort of remembering that this is an authoritarian regime and just because uh, the monarch speaks if the nice, you know, clear English and tells jokes and his wife looks recognizable, she's a beautiful woman with Western style clothing, etc. cetera. Uh, we forget that this is a repressive regime. This is a regime that destroys lives, that people sit in jail. Um, it, it, it represses and uh, protest activists are repressed um, often in such, say, if you won't stop protesting, nobody in your family, your extended family is gonna get into college, nobody. So your whole family puts pressure on you to stop. It destroys businesses. Um, one um, dentist has basically closed down his business because he can't keep employees because the employees get harassed by the secret police and so he simply can't keep employees. Um, another owns a chain of, uh, as a pharmacy importer and uh, the government has pressured everybody to cancel their contracts with him. So it, you know, it destroys lives, people are in prison. It's, you know, it, that's often gets forgotten because it's less bad than some of the other countries. And so that's something that I think is important um, for a journalist covering protests in Jordan, I would just urge them, well, obviously read my book, but I would urge them to, you know, obviously attend protests as much as possible and, uh, you know, uh, talk to, talk to not just the activists in the protests, which are very accessible, but, you know, talk to other people around businesses located near protest places to get a sense of, you know, people's expectation about protests. A lot of the protests are never covered in newspapers. Um, there, you have to kind of hear about them. I hear about a lot because a lot of people have been working on this project for almost 25 years. Um, I mean, not writing the book, but it, starting from that earlier project when I was starting to think about protests. 
uh, I have a lot of people tell me about stuff when it comes up because they know I'm covering it. So people will tweet to me right away or send me direct messages and let me know something's going on. If I'm in Jordan, you know, they'll send me a, a text message and I'll, you know, hop in a car and get over there as quickly as possible. Um, so like with anything, you know, you need to build up a network of researchers. But I just think paying attention to um, not just the dynamics of the protests themselves, but protest spaces and ask people where those spaces are. I document them in the book, but, but to go around the city and look at the city and look at the built environment and you really see the effects on, on uh, protest in space in a quite striking way. Are there examples in Jordan about the peace movements that help to build or maintain the state? I'm not sure what peace movements that would mean. Um, is there a specific women's right chapter in protests and demonstrations? So there isn't, and I actually, one of the reviews that came out of my book um, says, how come I don't address women more? And I do actually address women a lot. I just chose not to make it a separate, you know, ghettoized chapter, like here's the women's section. Because women are at like almost every protest. They're very vibrantly engaged in protests. Um, there's women's only protests. There's protests around issues related to women. For example, women can't pass their citizenship to their children. Only the man, the, the man, a Jordanian man can pass his citizenship to children. So if a Jordanian woman is married to a uh, Syrian, for example, her children are not Jordanian. So there's protests around that. There's protests around the so-called honor crimes. There's protests around a number of issues related to women. But women are active in all protests. A lot of the protests, particularly things like the Kaluti protests, um, the women will push right up to the front to the uh, in, to confront the riot police, which is actually a common uh, 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 tactic for protests globally, particularly if there's a lot of photographers there and journalists there, because you're daring the riot police to use violence on women, which is really bad image. So you'll find women that way. Um, interesting dynamic with women in the Muslim Brotherhood is women pro protest for sure in the Muslim Brotherhood protest, but they'll often have a cordoned off section where the women can gather and assemble that nobody can uh, um, bother them or harass them. So it's only women inside this area. And then that area will move through the march as they march, the men will lead the march and the middle section of women with the guards, the parade guards on each side moving through the protest. So there's a lot of really interesting uh, gender dynamics around protests, but women are absolutely super active in protests. Um, uh, I'd like to know, thank you, Roger. I'd like to know what about the political positions of the Palestinians and people whose parents are Palestinian? Um, could they generate pressure and change the Jordanian government monarchy? So they, there are, so yes, um, there are protests around those issues um, for sure. Uh, they're not only joined by Palestinians. You find a lot of activists. I mean, the Palestinian issues for Palestinians uh, are protested in all parts of Jordan. So you might have like the most remote East Bank tribal area. And if there's an Israeli campaign into Gaza, for example, everybody will be on the street everywhere. But there are protests around uh, Palestinian issues. There have been protests around uh, pa having different passports that give them different kinds of status. But a lot of Palestinians are cautious about that because they feel that they want um, to use other channels to try to affect um, their position uh, and not be, um, harassed and arrested. I mentioned earlier the Black September period um, after that, which the Black September was 1970, after the Civil War and the, the government, the army defeat the Palestinian Fedayeen and force them out of Jordan and they, the leadership goes off to Beirut. Um, to be a Palestinian activist was a very dangerous thing and many people were killed in the 70s. Um, thousands were killed, many, many more were tortured. And so there's still that, even though that's generations earlier, there's still that sort of lingering memory that kind of dangerous to really push the boundary if you're Palestinian. The people that push the boundary that openly criticize the king, I mean, many of them are in prison, um, but many of them are from these prominent tribal families that go way back to that founding period in the 20s when I was talking about, that made alliances with the regime. And so, you know, they might be prominently close to the regime, but that doesn't mean they're not gonna criticize the king. Um, so some of them in there will adhere to those red lines and not criticize the king personally. So for example, criticize the prime minister, but not the king. But others in there will criticize the king directly. But if they get arrested, the whole tribe is going to put pressure on the monarch to release to release them. So the point is that if you're from certain tribal families, it's 
easier to push the boundaries than if you are, for example, Palestinian, where you have no recourse. There's no prominent tribal leaders that are going to step up to sort of get you out. So that also inhibits the, the effect on it. But I think the government, when, the, when we have these massive protests, one of the reasons it doesn't repress um, the, um, uh, the marches to um, cancel the peace treaty they're not contentious. The protesters are adhering very closely to what they, you know, the sort of red lines and the routines that they do. But also, I mean, the government isn't, uh, you know, is fearful of another pa transfer of Palestinians into Jordan, um, gets pressure from its own constituencies, not only Palestinians, but the um, other East Bankers are pressuring the government to take care of this Palestine issue. Like the Palestinians need to go home. You know, they've been here long enough. They want to go home. They need to go home. Why aren't you doing enough to get them back there? So you have protests around that, pressuring the government, which of course, you know, there's there's no way Israel's going to take the Palestinians back, um, agree to that. But you'll have protests demanding that. In 2010, there was a manifesto issued by a veterans association, Association of Retired Veterans, uh, military, high military officials, uh, and one of their complaints was that the government wasn't doing enough to resolve the Palestine issue. So there's tremendous pressure on the monarch, but the monarch really you know, they're not willing to cancel the peace treaty. They're still trying to negotiate, even though that's basically a losing proposition. Um, to the 19th century, were there plans deployed by Ottoman authorities to sell out the idea of cultural religious brotherhood, perhaps as a way to prevent protests? Not that I'm aware of, um, not that I'm aware of, but I have to admit my work on the Ottoman period is uh, except for memoirs that talk about the Ottoman period, is all secondary sources because I can't read Ottoman, so I wasn't able to access the archives. So there may well be those kinds of issues there, but that I haven't seen um, it come up in my work um, in reference to protests. That would be ideal to be able to do that, but again, I don't have Ottoman. So I think I've answered the questions that you've had. Um, thank you so much for coming. And for those of you who are watching later, thank you so much. I really appreciate the chance to talk about my book, Protesting Jordan. Um, I hope it's of interest. And um, uh, I thank you so much for this opportunity.